Okay, let's go ahead and finish up this lecture on Bayesian linear regression. We had a couple other discussions linked to this, see the previous lectures, where we introduced the concept of bin. Hey, howdy everyone, let's go ahead and finish up this discussion about Bayesian linear regression. Now we had a couple lectures before where we introduced the first one, we introduced the fundamental concepts, we made some comparisons to the frequentist approach. Then what we had was a short lecture on Mont Markov chain Monte Carlo type of methods because we mentioned we can't solve for the model parameters in the regular way. We don't have a nice closed form solution. And for continuous predictor features, we're really in a situation where we can't just solve for it directly. We have to sample the problem, sample the posterior distribution. So we introduced Marco Monte Carlo Markov chain type of approaches in order to get that done. Okay, so let's go ahead and just look at an example that was worked up in Python. Let's go back to our original data set. This is it shown right here. We've grain size versus porosity. Yes, the data set is just cooked up. It's um I know the grain size of um, you know, getting to 10 centimeters is pretty large. We're talking cobble size, more than gravel for sure, I imagine. So maybe that's a little unrealistic for many reservoirs. But at the same time, let's say that we have this data and move on. And um, we can go ahead and run SciPy's linear regression. We could use scikit-learn too. And we go ahead and fit our model, and that's our model right there. If we were to calculate all of the residuals, you would find that for that training data, we could not fit a model that would do a better job of minimizing the residual sum of squares, the uh, sum of squares of those errors. So we could go ahead also and we could sample from the posterior distribution and we would build up distributions for the intercept, for the slope term, and also for the homoscedastic variance. And if we did that and we sampled from that, we'd, we'd get sets of models because when we're sampling the posture, we would get an intercept term, a slope term, and a variance term. And we could go ahead and just plot the slope and the intersect, plot that linear model like this. And we do 1,000 samples of the posture, we would get all of these models. Now, it'd be interesting to take those samples of the posture and to compare it to the ordinary least square solution, the frequentist approach for the model. And that's this line shown right here. So we just made a little bit of a comparison between the two. Now, it's also a good idea to look at, because remember, we are getting the actual distributions of the intercept, the slope, and the sigma term. And we can go ahead and see the intercept, the slope, the sigma right here. Now, it's also very useful to look at the trace plots so we can see the samples along our Markov chain of the intercept slope and the sigma. And if we look at that, we got four separate chains color coded as four different colors. And we can look and see the overall behavior of our four different chains of 1000 states or samples of the posture. And we'll notice that we have pretty good stationary behavior. We're exploring the space very nicely. We don't appear to have a burn-in set of estimates or chain that we need to remove off of the front. It seems like it's behaved quite well for us. We have done a pretty good job of sampling our posture distributions. And so we can see them for each one of the model parameters, the intercept term, the B0, the slope term, the B1, and the sigma term, the homoscedastic variance. And so, once again, we're getting at these distributions by sampling them with the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo approach. And so, another powerful thing to do is to summarize them statistically, not just visualize the sampling with a trace plot or with a kernel density smoother to get the PDF and so forth. Let's go ahead and look at the summary statistics and talk about them a little bit. And so, we could calculate the expectation, the standard deviation, and also a 2.5 and a 97.5 interval. Now this is interesting. These are not our regular confidence intervals. This is not a 95% confidence interval because we're Bayesians now. This is a 95% credible interval. And so this is actually something I really love about Bayes. It's much more intuitive. A credible interval is if 
it is a direct measure of the uncertainty in the model parameter. In other words, I can literally say I have a 95% probability that I will have the parameter will exist within that interval. Now, if you think about that, it's a little bit backwards with the frequentist approach. Confidence intervals that we get with the frequentist, frequentist approach are in fact the uncertainty in the interval, not the uncertainty in the actual model parameter. It's a measure really of whether or not the true parameter will be included within the interval, considering that if we had resampled through a frequentist approach, many different intervals, many different times, we figured 95%, if we had a bunch of those intervals, would include the true value. That's distinctly different, and I really dig what the Bayesians are doing here. So this, just to kind of try to capture that, that's important. Now, of course, we might also, we can visualize the credible in intervals by looking at the PDFs that we've calculated. We've got intercept B0, slope B1, and sigma, which is the, once again, the homoscedastic standard deviation square for the homoscedastic variance. And what we can notice here is that often what Bayesians will do when they talk about um, plotting a 95% credible interval, though usually, because if you think about it, you could plot a variety of different intervals. You could shift to one direction, shift to another direction. You have to choose about where to plot. And so they're more specific about that choice. They say, we'll pick the highest posterior density interval. And if you think about it, that's what this is, going from 6.3 to 9.8. That is the interval we could pick that would span 94% and would capture all of the highest density parts of the distribution. Okay, ah, kind of cool, really neat to look at. Let's. Do, one more thing we want to do is we want to make predictions with our Bayesian model. And so this is very powerful. So let's go ahead, we can pick a grain size, a specific grain size of 40 millimeters. And we'll say, I want to predict porosity at that location. Well, we go back to our Bayesian model, which gave us multiple samplings of the linear regression model. Here are 1,000 of them. And the red lines, they've got a um, alpha level pretty high. So you can see the pretty hard to see where there's only one model. But where there's many models, it causes a darker color. It gives you a perception of the density of the models a little bit. And so if we draw our line at 40 millimeters, we can see the uncertainty in the model predictions. And if I go over here in this plot, this is the expectation value that I would get across all of those models. It's also the mode of the uncertainty distribution, that posture distribution for making predictions. And we would have the uncertainty distribution given the model alone is shown by this blue distribution here. But remember, we assumed a homoscedastic variance, an uncertainty outside of the model. The model is uncertain, but then we also expect that there's going to be error around the model. So we add that homoscedastic variance in, we get this final distribution. This would be our uh, effectively our posture distribution for making a prediction of the porosity given a specific grain size that's specified with our model. Okay, so that was an example of Bayesian linear regression. I think that that was um, well, a lot of fun, but also very instructive, a lot of good ways to visualize and understand what's going on. And also there's some subtle but very important differences between machine learning with frequentist approaches versus Bayesian perspectives or approaches, which I think are really well illuminated by working through an example like this. All of these workflows are available to you on GitHub if you want to go ahead and check them out. I have the workflow that I use in this course. It's, a, it's available at that link down below. Go to my GitHub account. I'm Geostats Guy is my specific account. And you can go ahead and check that out. Check out the workflow. You have to install a couple new packages. Um, yeah. ARViz and also um, PYMC3, which will be required for doing the posture sampling with the Markov chain Monte Carlo approach and for visualizing the results. Anyway, as always, I hope that this was useful to you. This ends kind of a long lecture broken up into a bunch of videos. I hope it was digestible by, by you and of interest. I am Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. 
I work in data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning, and I post every single one of my lectures. I also share a lot of content on Twitter where I'm geostats guy. I also share a lot of content on GitHub. All of my workflows are available. Even for people just wanting to start out, there's some very simple starter workflows that I think I can help you um, get started with Python and building up your own um, data analytics and machine learning workflows. All right. As always, I hope that this was helpful for you. And um, hey, thank you very much for watching. Hey, take care.